on a lovely Monday evening. And I want to thank the Spiritual Journeys team of Jubilee for sponsoring this gathering. I really appreciate that they've done that. And I guess what we're going to do is speak. I, I've kind of divided the talk up into four sections, and I uh, hope there's enough handouts to go around. If there aren't, you can leave an email or an address, and I can send one to you if you'd like. Uh, there's about eight pages of, of notes that I'm more or less going to follow and that you don't necessarily have to have to read. And then the last two pages are a glossary of some terms and characters and numerical references in the matrix that, uh, that may or may not have some significance to the whole thing. So it's, um, it's a curious phenomenon, the matrix movies, in that it seems to have covered a, a fairly broad spectrum, spectrum of, of, uh, of people who have accepted it and, and have enjoyed it. And any movie that can sort of get you know, the, the, you know, the karate fans and the kung fu fans and the, um, and the more or less traditional Christian people to like the same movie has done something interesting, I think. Uh, there is a obvious Messiah story involved here. And there are actually a number of books written by um, traditional Christians on the Matrix who, um, who see it as, in, as a story of uh, salvation. Um, but, you know, you have Neo who is the, who becomes, uh, he, he rises from the dead at the end of the first movie. And you also have the character of Morpheus, who more or less plays a John the Baptist type character. How are we doing the back voice wise? Great. Good, thanks. So you've got a lot of a lot of really straightforward Christian elements going on there. But one of the things that they do, which is which is interesting, there's a lot of reversals, and I'll get into uh, some of that, how that works. But the main reversal, of course, is that the Messiah figure of Neo in this movie is not the Messiah, you know, as Christ who, who came down and, 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 and preached this uh, preaching of, of love and freedom and, and taking your own cross and, um, and, and following him in that way, but is really the, the Christ figure that was expected by the Jewish apocalyptic tradition at that time where they were expecting somebody to come down and kick butt and essentially you know, push the Romans out of there. So this, so this movie plays on that uh, apocalyptic expectation that the people of Zion are expecting this, this, this person to come in and save them, more or less in that form. And the movie you know, will play, plays that out. You know, he comes in and, and uh, as one of the directors said, it's essentially you know, Kung Fu versus the robots or something like that. So I guess it's like quick, has everyone seen the movie? No, you haven't. Has, has, has anyone else not seen the movie? Mm, okay. Well, it's a, it's a complicated plot, and I'm not sure I can get into it. I'll try to explain things as best as I can. And, and has everyone seen the second movie? No. No. Okay. The second, the second movie does some very interesting things in, in reversing um, what happens in the first movie, and, uh, and maybe I should maybe I should change course here and just give a really quick plot summary. I think I wasn't expecting to do this, but uh, essentially, someone this uh, character Neo, who's um, anagram for the One. He is uh, shown that he is living in a simulated, computer-generated world. 
by this character named, essentially named Morpheus, and another character named Trinity. And he is pulled out of that world. He's given a choice of taking a red clue, red clue, red pill, blue pill. The red pill, he's going to learn what the matrix is. This is the question that's driving him. The blue pill, he goes back essentially to sleep and lives out in this computer generated matrix, not knowing that it is such. Okay. He takes the red pill, wakes up, he's in a rather um, unsavory, sort of very harsh, bland environment. He finds out that the, uh, the world has essentially been taken over by, by artificial intelligence that was created by human beings. They, uh, and that there's this prophecy that this person called the One was going to be born to uh, end this particular war between the, uh, the machines and the, um, the, the surviving Earth people. The machines have put uh, an, uh, most of the population of humans inside these little pods. They're dreaming this matrix world. They're hooked up in there. And meanwhile, they're supposedly serving as these batteries that power the machines. Uh, the, the humans that die are somehow fed back into the humans that are, are living. It's, it's rather gruesome. <laughs> but not far from the truth. <laughs> So the movie unfolds, Neo learns all these kind of uh, cool things, uh, combat techniques inside computer simulated programs. He enters back into the matrix, kicks robot butt, and um, in the end, but then the, in the end he, he does die, but yet from the kiss from Trinity, he is reborn, and then he sees the totality of the matrix. He learns how to manipulate the computer's program while within it. And, uh, and he's then able to do whatever he, he wants. He becomes, he flies, whatever. So that's how the first movie ends. Second movie, there's a, there's a number, of, number of more characters going on, but he has to, his quest is to enter the source. And he's not sure why. And he's led by this character called the Oracle and several other characters, um, the, the plot moves along, and I'll, I'll get very quickly to the end. He gets, he, he ends up through a very series of things, series of adventures, he gets inside the mainframe of the whole matrix, he meets a character called the architect of the matrix, the architect of the matrix is uh, going to come up in our discussion tonight. He's very um, connected with the platonic and later Gnostic term of the demiurge, also another Translation for architect. Um, Neo thinks he's coming in to sort of save Zion and end this war. Finds out instead from the architect that, in essence, the architect who designed the first matrix made this perfectly happy world. Humans rejected it because it was just too happy. Humans need suffering. So that didn't work. He makes another world, and the idea was a certain at a certain level, humans had to accept the choice of being in the matrix, even if it was unconscious. So, and the ones that don't accept are kind of given this, this sort of renegade outlet. And they can go to this place called Zion. Um, and what happens is, the fact that there are renegade elements creates um, disruptions in the structures of the programs. The program cannot withstand that for too long so they created, the machines created this mythology of the one who has to re-enter into the mainframe, essentially rebooting the whole system. So you have a whole cycle. And then he's given the choice, he supposedly takes um, 16 women and seven men and rebuilds the alternate city. And, it, and so the cycle begins again. And uh, he supposedly is the uh, sixth. Right, there are five before and he's the sixth. And so he learns at the end, so he, see he learns at the end that what he thought was a, a, a system of freedom was just another system of control by the machines. So that's where the second movie ends, when he's, real, when he's made that realization. So the third movie leaves you with a lot of open questions. The third movie's opening November 5th, um, and I think the, the second movie's coming out on video, middle of next month sometime. 
Was that relatively lucid? Okay. Well, there's one point, and maybe you're going over this, but uh, it did seem like they were, were drawing a similarity to the Christ in the second movie, though, when they dealt with some of the North Star, because that was the star that didn't exist before Christ was born. Well, did you see any of that? Well, let me, let me, let me do this, because... Um, what I, what I prefer to do is get through the material I want to, and then, and then we can just have a wide open discussion at the end. And, uh, and, and specific to what you said, I'm not sure. Okay. So, so that, um, because I tend to frazzle easily. <laughs> so let me try to get through the material, and then, and then we'll open up at the end for, for, uh, for discussion, if you don't mind. Unless you don't understand something specifically that I've said, I'd be happy to repeat that. Um, the first movie begins with, uh, well not, well actually the second scene, the first movie begins um, with, with Trinity escaping in the Matrix and you don't know what, what's going on. Um, and then uh, we, the next scene is where the, uh, the Messiah figure, Neo, is in his room and he's asleep next to a computer and he's got massive attack playing on his headphones, which I guess is uh, supposed to the preamble to what's coming. And the computer says, wake up, Neo. And, he, so he, and then all of a sudden there's a knock, knock, and it says, follow the rabbit. And someone comes to the door. And there's a character called uh, Choi. And there's a bunch of people, and they're all uh, dressed up in you know, leather and PVC and, and other oily fabrics. And um, the character is buying something. It looks like a drug deal. But so Neo goes to the shelf and picks a book off, up off of the shelf. And the book is called Simulation and Simulacra, which is by a French philosopher, postmodern philosopher uh, named Baudrillard. And it opens up to the chapter on nihilism. And inside the book is computer software. And he goes and he uh, makes the, the deal with the gentleman. It's 2000 whatever it is, whatever the unit is in the matrix, uh, for this for this illegal software. So it opens up with a very curious thing. Now, so I'm going to talk a little bit about postmodernism and about uh, Baudrillard with the, uh, the caveat that um, I'm doing this first because uh, postmodernism generally gives me the willies. And in fact, um, I uh, ran, not walked out of a uh, PhD program when they changed the dissertation requirements to make me do a dissertation on uh, postmodern literary theory. So that ended my academic career. So this is a uh, bit of a catharsis. <laughs> so you have a fake book within a fake world selling software. Now what does software relate to when the whole, when the whole world is software? when the whole of all existence is ruled by software. So what kind of software could he possibly be making within, within that context? All right. um, the character Choi goes to him and you know, he, he says, oh, you're, you know, my, you're my personal Jesus Christ. Okay, so you have the first reference to him as the Messiah figure, very, very direct blunt. Um, so, so that, and then he, you know, then he, he also makes um, a reference to mescaline. Okay, and so to me, the reference to mescaline is a very sly reference to uh, Aldous Huxley's um, Doors of Perception. And if you don't know that book, it was, it was in, I believe, the early 60s. He, uh, he wrote a book uh, where he, he delineated his, uh, his, his mescaline journey, and um, he was relating it to a lot of Eastern philosophy as he was going on. But the title, Doors of Perception, is related to the quote, and that's the quote that begins on the handout you have there. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. That's from William Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. So for Blake, this idea of having the doors of perceptions cleansed would be this, this direct perception of the real, and the direct perception of the real is, is, um, 
is, I'm guessing, for him an experience that he had and that certainly gave rise to his, to his uh, art and poetry. Um, but for postmodernism, that's not really a possibility. And uh, to take, um, to get to, I'm going to give you a, a, a quick tour of the 20th century to get to postmodernism. Postmodernism essentially uh, comes out after World War II. But to, to tell you what postmodernism is, you kind of have to say what modernism is. So modernism comes out of essentially the turn of the last century when at the end of the Newtonian uh, worldview, where the worldview was very mechanical and pretty much, you know, God had this incredible machine through it in motion, and all we had to do is figure out how, to, how it works. Well, by the end of the 1800s, um, there were a number of uh, cracks in that theory, and eventually we get to the point of uh, Einstein's uh, special and general theory of relativity, and um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle of the quantum mechanics, where it was being shown that there is some sort of relationship between consciousness and the world. There's, there's some sort of connection between the two. You can't know uh, things for certain. And so then when you get into art and, and literature, things start breaking down. You have people like Faulkner would write novels with, with many different um, perspectives. There'd be different characters' perspective or things like that. The idea of the omniscient narrator kind of dies off at that point. Um, even, I mean, even um, something like James Joyce's Ulysses is still a holistic vision and has a lot of different things. Each chapter is written in a completely different literary style. Then, you know, and then in, in, in painting, the idea of, you know, of, of seeing something in painting, it starts breaking down also. You know, you've got Monet's painting like he's got cataracts and you, you've got um, Picasso with, you know, faces all distorted and all over the place clock stripping and all that kind of stuff. So the, um, so the idea of, of an ultimately um, objective noble world breaks down at that point. And then what, what goes on also in the political realms, you have a lot of um, other fun things and mostly uh, fascistist kind of movements. Um, and then when communism starts, course in the 1800s and then comes to fruit in 1917 in Russia um, and then so you've got this whole capitalism versus communism thing going going on and of course they're both really forms of materialism in the end um, capitalism being time is money everything is, is, is starts becoming commodified in uh, Marxism it's pretty much the same thing in fact um, I just, my, my only difference I can really see between the two is that communism is, is capitalism for, for the few. And actually, it's more like capitalism is capitalism for the few, and Marxism is capitalism for the very few. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the depth of my political theory. <laughs> so, so we have that movement. So, so then, once you get, start getting past World War II and all the experiences uh, uh, people had with, with the horrors of what went on during that time, things become more and more into question. And also you can see that the, 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 uh, the dominant political force is one of, of control when you get to the, the fascist movements and things like that. The, the idea of, of, of control becomes very, very important. Uh, so then, once you start moving into the 60s and things like that, um, where, where even like art, even in the time of like the Surrealist and the Dadaist and all that, they would all have some kind of manifesto. So they would have, you know, some place that they're coming from when they were doing their work. This is what we want to show you. By the time you get to, you know, Andy Warhol and his soup cans, that art has become complete commodity. He, art is what you can sell as art. And art is what you can get people to buy as art. Okay, so everything's moved into a total commodification. And some of the artists here may disagree with my oversimplifications, but that's but let me have my fun. So, and you know, and, and so you've got Jackson Pollock. To me, Jackson Pollock, his art 
is more mostly about Jackson Pollock making art than anything else. So the other <coughs> element of the postmodern is <coughs> self referentiality, right? Everything refers back to itself. Novels referring that everything becomes sort of like a closed unit because you can't say anything about the world, you can't say anything about the real. So this is sort of Baudrillard's uh, viewpoint. And uh, his, at one point, uh, Morpheus, the character Morpheus, when he's showing Neo the supposed real world, right, he's, he should, but how does Neo see the supposed real world? He sees it inside a computer simulation on a television. So it's like thrice abstracted and, and displayed. So you don't even know if that has anything, any kind of relationship to the real world. And he says, welcome to the desert of the real. So the desert of the real uh, comes from Baudrillard. But he takes it, uh, he takes it from a, a short piece by uh, George Luis Borges, an Argentinian writer. And who, in 1964, wrote a, a short piece. He wrote very, a lot of very short, interesting, uh, little mind-bending pieces. But he spoke of this situation where you had a, the cartographers who were so incredibly good and versatile, they ended up making larger and larger maps until the map eventually became as large as a territory, so that you couldn't see one for one for the other, and that eventually they gave up. Well, for Baudrillard, the map has completely covered the territory. We live in the map. We don't live in the territory. The desert of the real, the only place you can even find the, um, the real at all is on, in, the, in the desert, in these outlying places, okay? Which is kind of interesting, though it, it doesn't come up for him, but it's interesting because the desert is, is traditionally where, where you would go, especially most notably Christ would go to get the spiritual information, uh, information, inspiration also. So, uh, so there's that tradition also, which is kind of an uh, a reversal of what Baudrillard is saying. But for Baudrillard, there is no ability to connect to the real. All we have is language. Language is the map that overlays everything. Okay? Um, you guys thought we were going to talk about the matrix, right? <laughs> so the matrix, then, because what, what, what are these, what, what, the guys who are making the, the movies, two Polish brothers from, from Chicago, Wachowskis, who read a lot of philosophy. Um, and The Matrix is not a whole vision, it doesn't work perfectly, it's, it's not the greatest movie ever done, um, but I, I certainly applaud its attempt. And one of the things that's a mark of a postmodern piece is this sort of referencing a whole bunch of different things and sort of throwing it together, which is kind of how we live, you know, you, more and more so every day, you need to listen to music, you know, you got to Peter Gabriel got a doo-doo player from Armenia, and you know, an African drummer, and, and all these people, and, and just trying to make it work together. So I think it's like sort of wide range of references because we, you know, we've lost any kind of you know, tradition to come from. So the Matrix then, so there, obviously this movie is an allegory, the allegory of, 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 of our situation. That's what they're trying to depict. And they start off right away making this uh, allusion to uh, postmodernism and, and uh, nihilism. So for, for Baudrillard, um, is a word is a word called uh, Disneyfication. Okay, I, uh, I grew up in New York City, and I remember as a teenager going into Manhattan, and we used to go to Theater District, and you would have, you know, an Arthur Miller play. You know, right next to these these like CD triple triple X places, and, and that was just what the theater district was. But um, since um, since Lord Rudy Giuliani took over and talked about forces of control, gave the police complete reign to do whatever they wanted. All right, yes, they cleaned up the city. Yes, crime went down. On the other hand, you go to the theater district. You know, there's 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 Goofy jumping up and down, and. <coughs> And uh, honestly, Goofy scares me more. <laughs> you know, so, so there's sort of this Disneyfication. So in other words, the whole idea of going to Disney World and you know, seeing animated alligators jumping up at you and things like that, right? we've taken the danger out of life and we've just uh, abstracted into it. So this is, again, the idea of the map covering the territory. 
So, so we have the so, and the exemplification of this is in the movie. We have the character Cipher, who uh, sells out Orpheus and, uh, and through Orpheus Neo, uh, he wants to be reinserted into the Matrix. He wants he wants his stake. Okay, very significant that his name in the Matrix world is Reagan, and he wants to be an actor. <laughs> it's very significant because um, Ronald Reagan was the first really contemporary postmodern president who, who only acts as president. I would, I would speculate that Jimmy Carter was maybe the last president to think for himself, right or wrong. He had his own thing that he, that he wanted to do. Uh, Ronald Reagan acted as president. And then the, also the other aspect of postmodernism is this sort of this sort of uh, ideology. Ronald Reagan was very much an ideologue, uh, and I'm, I'm sure he could t believe totally what you know what he was doing. But so uh, um, this character Cipher, who interesting enough, uh, the word Cipher, one of the meanings of the word Cipher is zero, and then you have to combine that with, with Neo, which is the one. So between that, you have the complete machine language. All machine language, all computers, are, are a binary system, right? Based on ones and zeros. Within within various combinations of ones and zeros, you have everything. Um, much current scientific thinking is that we are also that um, that our neurons fire on and off. So it's the same kind of binary system. Um, in general, I think that the, those who think that, the, uh, that, that they're only using 20% 20, 20 of the brain, maybe they are, but maybe they just don't know what the rest of the brain is doing. And then my speculation is that the brain is, is working very hard to keep us connected to the spiritual, um, which is not, you know, for most modern theory, our consciousness is only an epiphenomenon of neurons firing in our brain. It's just a, a byproduct, sort of like Compost is a byproduct of peeling carrots. Well, you know, our, our thinking, our ability to think and perceive and have experience is just a byproduct of these neurons firing happily away in our brain. So I don't agree with that, but um, most scientists do. So, um, yeah, so back to uh, this whole idea of, of the postmodern and the matrix. Um, the real becomes a spectacle. We live in the map, and I told you again, the map is language, and language is how, how control is, is operative. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing about, the, the name of the book is Simulation and Simulacra, so everything is a, is a simulation of the real. You don't have, and you can't even contrast it to anything because it's only simulation. You don't have a, a real to bounce it against. So, um, quote from Baudrillard, the real no longer needs to be rational because it no longer measures itself against either an ideal or negative instance. So at one point, when Neo is learning about what the matrix is, Morpheus uh, tells him the matrix is control. And he says, um, it's when, when you watch TV, when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay, to pay your taxes. You know, it's, it's around you all the time. So this is, um, so each of those four instances, they're very interesting. One, when you're watching TV, it's the greatest operative of control in our lives. Um, I advocate not only shutting it off, but un unplugging it, I think. Um, uh, the idea, is, is to see, you think about the, the, uh, the matrix, people just sitting in the pods having this experience, but the same thing, sitting back in an easy chair and, and, and sitting there with the remote. And I just came to this realization that it's, the, um, it's not you that control the TV through the remote, it's the TV that controls you through the remote. You don't have to get up, you don't have to move, you don't have to do anything, you can totally control. You sit there, you're completely receptive to whatever's coming to you. So I would suggest unplugging. That's why I'm on the preacher mode now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, second uh, method of control when you go to church. Okay, I think that's massive. When we go into talk about Gnosticism, of course, Gnosticism was uh, stamped out because it tried to exist outside of the early Christian church's control. 
it felt that uh, it, want, it thought it, gnosis, uh, Greek word for knowledge, cognate with our word, with knowledge. They thought that you people had the right to get to themselves, get themselves to knowledge, to understanding what the real is. Um, the, the, the bishops of the church had other ideas. They thought that they should be the mediators, that everything should go through them. So there's another operative uh, control. Um, government corporations, I don't even want to go there. <coughs> Neo works, works in a, his company is called Meta Core Tex. Okay, so it's, it's controlling your, your old mind. He has a little cubicle. Um, the other, the, and the government, and the, whole, the other thing I want to uh, mention also is this whole idea of um, one of the ways forces of control is to set people apart from each other, this whole liberal conservative thing, right? It's a complete total abstraction. It means absolutely nothing. Um, people get angry, bent out of shape, yelling, killing, whatever. And it means absolutely nothing. The, the whole thing is all based on, on abstracted principles. I mean, the, the whole concept of America is an abstraction, right? I mean, where is America? Is this America? Is this America? Find America somewhere. Right? America doesn't exist. So it will exist in the matrix. People's minds become, they come to this agreement, but America doesn't exist anywhere. You know, ask the Native people, where's America? You know, America's control. So, it's another aspect of it. Um, so, and I guess um, this whole idea of postmodernism is that is that there is no system of knowing possible, uh, and then the, the, the force of what controls is language. Ideology, ideology is our perception of, of uh, reality. We see things, we see all, uh, we, we, are, we have essentially prepackaged political opinions that are given to us. We don't learn to think for ourselves. And the last point I want to bring on that has to do with food, which is something we don't think about much, but uh, I think about a lot. And, um, and I'm going to read a quote that thanks to, um, thanks to Alan Chadwick, who used this quote very, Alan Chadwick was uh, a biodynamic gardener who passed about 20 years ago. And he would start many of his talks with this quote from Robert Graves, who you may know from uh, Claude Claudius and uh, White Goddess. So he said, the decline of the true taste for food is the beginning of the decline in national culture as a whole, the client of the true taste for food. When people have lost their authentic personal taste, they lose their personality and become the instruments of other people's will. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an interesting connection between food and totalitarian control? All right, because, I mean, in, in, the, uh, in the Matrix they talk about, you know, the, the feeding the, the human babies, um, some sort of stuff from the uh, from, from the dead people in the matrix. Well, what do we feed cows? You go to McDonald's, you're eating a cow that's been eating cows. And the same thing goes on. Right? It's horrible. Um, food, you know, and, it, and, it's, and it's a huge issue, and, and I'm sure there's a pretty savvy crowd as far as that goes. Um, but one of the things that I, I've learned uh, through Alan Chadwick and is that Originally, food was grown for a spiritual purpose, and it was grown in accordance with the movement of the stars, the movement of the planets, and each plant has a, a specific um, guiding planet. And if you know how to grow, and there's a whole art form to this, you can get the, the correct spiritual influences in the food, you eat the food, and that's what's going in you, not a cow that's eating a cow, not, um, or that, you know, it's been you know, prodded to death, or, um, you know, or, or, or a plant that's been, you know, um, uh, sprayed until there's like nothing left to it, and, and just, you know, made for its hardness and its, and its, and its view, and what, what it looks like to you, okay? So, I think that's, that's another really important thing, 
is, is to understand how uh, food is necessary, real food, to, make, uh, to make, make, remake these connections that I think we need to be made. Okay. Um, so it's very interesting that within the, the Matrix movies, food is often used as a programming device. So you have, um, initially, when, when the first movie, Neo goes to see the Oracle, and the Oracle uh, tells him that he's not the one, um, which is essentially to get him to not be the one because everyone's telling him he's the one. It makes him, it makes him move and do his, do his own thing. You have to become the one. You can't just, you know, somebody tells you that, that you're there and you're not there. So she tells him that he isn't. And he's just kind of befuddled by the whole thing and she gives him a cookie. He says, when you leave, you'll feel right as rain. So there's that instance. Um, later on in, in another instance, she gives him a piece of candy. In the second movie, there's a character uh, called the Merovingian. Uh, Merovingian. And I'll, I'll get to more about, hopefully I'll get to more about him later. Um, but he sort of has this sort of realm of, con of his own control within the Matrix. And he's writing little programs, uh, a little piece, he says a piece of, he sort of has sort of runs his restaurant, he's sort of like this, this, this uh, faux French restaurateur. And he sends a piece of cake to someone, and it causes um, a reaction in her. And this, so there's a whole idea of food being another method of control for, for the, the artificial intelligence inside the matrix, that's how they're another uh, vehicle for controlling and, and the idea, and also back to the stake idea, was you know, that, that the, the character Cypher betrays everybody, for the, forget about the 30 pieces of gold, you know, he, be, he, he betrays them for a juicy steak. And Okay. Second, sir, how are you doing? Good. Okay. Well, is it, is it pertinent? Go ahead. Um, it, it may be pertinent. Um, I'll just make it really quick. You, you, my name is Michelle. You mentioned that um, it, at the decline of true taste of food, mm -hmm. there would be a, de a decline in... Uh, it's in the handout. Do you have the handout? Uh, the word you used, I guess, and it would go because you could have bacterianism. Okay, yeah. If you want, I can get you a copy of the handout. Okay. Um, what I wanted to mention is that um, getting into the spiritual law of, of harmony, food, and, go, and also mentioning of the fake, fake book, food was not described as, as animal or cow. Food had a, um, uh, a more um, pleasing, you know, the plants, the green herbs, that sort of thing. So. In which context? Uh, in which concept? In, in which context of which food are you talking about? Food so, in the matrix so or food if, in if the So if mankind weed? lost its real taste for food and accepted the carnivore diet, it's losing its real taste for food, what was the real food, and it's accepting a false concept or uh, uh, something without divine authority because there wasn't divine authority to, to kill animals or anything to eat food. So, you may be right, there is a... Um, yeah, um, yeah I, I won't disagree with you, but I, I think what the, the, that particular quote is more pointing to is about people developing authentic taste, whether it's taste for food, taste for art, uh, taste for a lot of different things. He's talking about food in that instance because it's really interesting and it's not something that people bring up. But just your taste at all, to have your own individual taste, because our tastes are given to us, they're packaged, they're, they're sent to us. We we you know we, we buy them on TV. We we have um, is a thought to have. In other words, our karma. In other words, karma karma being from the Indian word uh, occurred to do to make action. Just just plain action. Forget about the law of karma and all that stuff. Okay, our karma, where we're coming from, our our actions are all becoming homogenized. So we're becoming wall culture. We're all given what 
we're given tastes. We're given what to like, what to dislike. So we're not, we don't have our authentic taste anymore. You know, we're given them. We're given the taste, the, the idea of having milkshakes and things like that. You, know, you follow what I'm saying? So I think that's more of what we're getting at. We're, we're losing our, our ability to choose individually and to be individual peoples. And part of that is, is, is the food, but it's also, I think, extended to any kind of thing. Probably the key would be defining out what real food is and getting back to it and getting away from um, a sense of um, ignorant control and going to a sense of Yeah, well, I mean, we, yeah, we can spend a long time trying to figure out what to do. That's, that is my life. And as soon as I figure it out, I guess you were the first. <laughs> All right, so the second thing I, I wanted to bring up was Plato. Um, and by extension, things Greek, because we have an oracle in, the, in both movies, a very interesting character. And when we, uh, we meet her, she's, you know, she's not generally what you'd expect in an oracle to be. She's essentially some black grandmother, you know, making cookies. But of course, if you know about the oracle at, at, at Delphi, um, the, uh, the priest is called Pythia, right? would sit on a tripod over a particular uh, crevice, and up from the crevice came a certain gas um, they would go into some kind of altered state, they would be asked questions, they would give usually incomprehensible answers that had to be interpreted. Um, and these were the priestesses of, of, of Apollo. So for example, um, I think it was a Persian, was it Xerxes or Cyrus, one of the Persian kings, <coughs> consulted the or oracle about an upcoming war. And the Oracle gave him the answer, well, you will destroy a great army. Of course, little did, did he know the army was his own. <laughs> so you got to listen closely. <coughs> and you got to pull your desire. So this is a perfect example of your, of your desires reading the answer of the Oracle. It's a perfectly, you know, ambiguous answer. But he read it, he read it completely wrong. Uh, and then the other most famous one is uh, Socrates, who consults his, actually his friend, consulted the Oracle to find out if Socrates was the wisest person alive. The oracle, in fact, did say, yes, Socrates is the wisest person alive. Uh, Socrates can't believe it. He goes and questions pretty much everyone in Greece to find someone wiser. Um, he finds out that, that, um, that, that uh, he's no wiser than, than they are, but he knows that. Everyone else thinks they know. Um, so, um, so Socrates said, well, by default, I'm the wisest. And uh, let's see where it got him. <laughs> so in book seven of Plato's Republic, this is probably the most famous of Plato's allegory. It's the allegory, it's the allegory of the cave. So in the allegory of the cave, um, we are likened to prisoners trapped, sits, uh, chained into a seat. You can only face forward. You can face this way, but anyway. So imagine that you are all uh, unable to move. There would be a fire behind you, you're in a cave. Um, below the fire, there's a, a wall. And behind the wall, people, presumably people walk, carrying various objects. So what you would see projected here would be the shadows of those <laughs> objects going in front of you. You would not be able to turn around. You would not be able to see the real. You'd only be seeing the shadow or the simulation or the matrix. Okay, so for Plato, that's um, a very apt metaphor for, for more, most human condition. And in his allegory, he discusses someone breaking loose, being, being unchained, salute, uh, and, and brought up to the light. And you can't just be you know, brought right up into the sunlight if you're living in a cave. You have to be you know, brought up gradually by stages. First, you can see maybe starlight, what have you. And you can move gradually into becoming to see by the sun, which is the light of the real. Uh, so for Plato, this is, of course, the spiritual sun that he's discussing, or for him to be the good or the one, to get back to the reference to the movie. So, so what's interesting in that the Matrix, is, again, is, is referencing this particular allegory. Everyone's seated in a little pod, trapped. They're, they're seeing what's presenting to them, and they're taking it for being absolutely the real. All right, so of course, when Neo gets pulled out of that, 
and shown the next level of what's real. Um, you know, you can't believe it. He's in, he's in denial, and it's, it's very rushed on him. He has to gradually accept the fact that what was before, because how, how could you? Uh, if everything you've been shown is, is false, you know, what, what do you have left to stand on? You know, it's, 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 quite, it's quite difficult, at least. But, so it's interesting, though. So for Plato's allegory, they pulled out of a cave. So of course, in the Matrix, Neo was brought into a cave. The, uh, the world of Zion is essentially the world of the sewer systems left over. It's underground. The, uh, the city of Zion is, is supposedly close to the center of the Earth, where, where, it's, where it's supposedly warm. I guess where it's warm enough for them to inhabit it somehow. So, um, so it's another one of these reversals where, where, where the cave and the, so he's brought into the real, which is more like a cave. And what's the real like? You know, they're wearing tattered clothes. They're on this, you know, rusty, half falling apart ship. Uh, the world of the real, as far as the Matrix goes, is, is very unattractive. On the ship, they eat um, food that, you know, plops into these little, like, sardine can kind of things. Um, and it has no flavor at all. In fact, they argue about what is flavor. And it's just, you know, it's just whatever it is. they say it is, you know, proteins, amino acids, everything. And the person says everything a body needs. Well, of course, it's not every, it's, it's every, it may be everything a body needs, but it's, it's not more than that. So, so in this scene, so, so this, this world that's supposedly the real is, is shown to have, you know, certain limitations and, and undesirable characteristics. And so what's odd about the movie, of course, is that the Matrix itself, is, when we're watching it, is much more attractive to us, you know, and everybody gets, gets to dress up in, in, in shiny things and um, <laughs> jump very high. And, um, I'm just jealous because I, I, I don't want to be able to see. So yeah, they're going to jump around there and they get the, the, the shiny things. And so the world of the Matrix, in a certain sense, is made to look very attractive. So that's another, you know, reversal. But, on the, on, but the, also, what they did in the Matrix, uh, the, uh, the directors, is that everything has this sort of sickly green tint to it that, that, that was done consciously and they kind of blot out the sun in the outdoor scenes. And everything's got this sort of sickly green tint to it. And, you know, then you got the, and of course, when he takes the red pill, because the red pill is significant of blood and of life. Um, Plato. And then Plato uh, further, uh, I don't even know if I'm going to get into the allegory of the line, but probably, probably too far down. Um, but for uh, the idea of learning, for Plato, is called anamnesis, which is to remember. Okay, so for him, you're only remembering what's, you know, what's in you already, which is sort of the process that, um, that Neo goes through. So a couple of interesting things. The other thing, the, the cave though is sort of uh, contiguous with the real, uh, whereas the uh, the matrix really doesn't exist anywhere. You know, I mean, there's no physical place where the matrix exists. You know, you've taken the context of the movie and the fact that we have this omnis omniscient view of what goes on in the matrix. And of course, that view doesn't exist anywhere, given given the parameters of the movie. Right? No one, no such thing as an omniscient view. It's only in it's only in people's minds, people's experience. Um, but you have a sort of this sort of same movement of, of enlightenment and, and self-knowledge, um, and what Neo has to um, overcome. And I'll get, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, traditional initiation, and we'll talk a little bit about what he has to overcome there. And in another of uh, Plato's dialogues. Timaeus, he talks about the architect. The architect, uh, again, it shows up in the second movie, as the, uh, right at the end of the second movie, as the, as the creator of the Matrix. But, uh, and, the, and this, this same demiurge comes up again in, in Gnosticism. But um, for, the, for the Timaeus and for Plato's, is this sort of a, is it the creation kind of theory thing. And there's the architect who makes this world. 
and we can't speak of the maker of everything. That's that's sort of beyond language you're talking about, but we can talk about the maker of, of uh, this world. And that particular demiurge, essentially dealing with you know matter and, and things less you know fully spiritual, did the best job you know, that he could given 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 the materials that he had. Um, the the architecture of the matrix. The, the, the difference I wanted to bring out was that the, uh, the matrix architect is doing something on a level of, of, of pure mathematics and again using one and zeros, right? So let's say uh, it's a dyadic system and it's, it's only that is possible. And uh, the fact that the machines can't get beyond that is mostly exemplified in the second movie by the uh, Agent Smith. Agent Smith can replicate himself. He can't go any further, but he replicates himself on everybody. Okay, he can't get, he can't move beyond that. He can't. That's that's the limit of his creation, and that would and that would presumably be the limits of a of machine type creation. It would be this sort of this sort of replication of itself, and that's again this dyadic movement. Well, Pla Plato's uh, demiurge creates using a three in the triangle system. And, um, and I, I, I have these uh, sort of uh, in a handout, but the triad for Plato uses a bunch of different names, being, becoming, and the receptacle, uh, father, mother, child, um, model for generation, process of generation, uh, that in which generation takes place. In other words, you have the, uh, the, the unattachable, what do you call it, the unintelligible being, what do Plato called platonic forms, all right? These are uh, made into this physical world through a process he calls imitation. He never gets any, gets any more than that. You have to guess what that, what that means. And, the, and the, uh, the place in which it happens is called the mother or the matrix or the womb, or the nurse of generation, things like that, all right? But, um, what I want to bring out is this difference between this, this two and this, and this three. Because, and I'll throw one more metaphor at you. It's a musical metaphor. Um, you uh, pluck a string, you get a note. Take the same string and you pluck it in half, you're going to get the same note, only an octave higher. Okay, that's like the basic miracle of music. Okay. Um, so, and each time you can keep on cutting this in half, and you're always going to get the same note, an octave higher. All right, you're not going to go anywhere, you're going to only get the same note. Right, this is this dyadic, dyadic method of creation. So in order to make a world, you're going to have to cut it into thirds. You get the relationship of two to three, or three to four. That gives you the um, perfect fourth and fifth. The next thing you know, you have a musical scale, and you can make music. Okay, that's a really broad stroke, but is that fairly understandable? I'm just trying to exemplify the difference between this sort of three level three-part creation of Plato's Demiurge and the architect of the matrix, which again can only replicate itself. Going back to postmodernism, um, the, the, the simulation can only be operational. It can only spawn further and further simulations of itself. It can't get back to the real. Well, with, with Plato, you can get back to the real through through the realization of, that, of, of the imitation. Okay. You doing okay? Again. All right, the third part I want to talk about is uh, Gnosticism. And like I said before, Gnostics were 
early uh, group of Christians, and uh, up until the really fairly recently, we didn't know much about them except through refutations of, uh, of uh, the standard church writers, um, Tertullian and, and I forget the others. And they would write refutations of their works. Um, but in uh, 1945 or 46, about the same time as the Dead Sea Scrolls were uncovered, which was very interesting, read at the atomic bomb was dropped, maybe a connection there, I don't know. Uh, they found buried in Egypt a, a cask, and inside were, were these uh, papyri. And they had the actual texts that were buried um, probably in the year 300 or so somewhere in the 300s, and that all these wild, diverse uh, texts that were held by this Christian monastery. All right, of course, at the time, uh, it was soon after probably the Council of Nicaea, where the, uh, the, the four Gospels became, right, this is, what we, this is what we teach, nothing else. And so all other texts would be confiscated, burned, and, and probably still housed in the Vatican Library, which is one place I like to go for a while. <laughs> So they found this, this jug and they said, well, these alternative Christian texts. So that's how we learned a lot more about the Gnosis. We found that early Christianity was incredibly diverse, uh, com incredibly contradictory. So Gnosticism is sort of a broad word for, for all of this um, sort of alternative early Christianity. The, the couple of main things, like I said, it, it rejected the authority of the bishops to bring you to the full knowledge Christ. But they had a, a bunch of other things that were very interesting. And you can see why they, um, they caused some trouble. Um, so, uh, for example, there was one uh, Gnostic named Marcion. And uh, his point was, well, you have the creator God of the Old Testament. Well, he has a world full of evil and suffering and horrible, and, and this, this guy, he doesn't seem very pleasant. He's not like the kind of guy you'd like to have a beer with or anything. Um, so there must be, there must be another creator higher than uh, than him who who who, who made, made the, the real world. That this is this this is uh, this what he's calling the demiurge is a lower god, and so so they're claiming uh, that the god of the New Testament is essentially this this deluded um, demiurge who created this world, made a terrible mess of it, and you know we're kind of stuck with it, and our only way out of it is through gnosis. This, is, this was Christ's mission, was to show us how to get to. Um, another teacher, Valentinius, said he, he, was, he learned it from a student of, of Paul. And this was sort of like a secret teaching of, uh, of Christ with his way through uh, Gnosis. And so there are a couple of general things you can say about Gnosis. Like I said, it was, it was pretty um, widespread, a lot of, a lot of uh, extreme variations. But um, one of the things is this, this sort of myth. And the myth was that everything sort of emerges from the fullness of the, of the Godhead. And the, the hierarchies, they call them aeons, A-E-O-N-S. And they kind of got separated off from the Godhead. Sophia had this longing to return back to the one, she sort of splits in two, the higher part of Sophia returning, the lower part of Sophia, and Sophia, you, you might want to take it just for the word wisdom or however you want to do it, it's, it's, it's really up for grabs, gives birth to the demiurge. Uh, the demiurge is the one who is the architect of this, of this world, and that demiurge is sometimes equated with uh, Yahweh, the Old Testament. So the Demiurge rules the world with these fallen angels and archons. They're called they're sometimes called archons. And so you can kind of get how this is this is much related to how the Matrix operates. You have these in the first movie. It's mostly these um, these agents that are kind of moving around and, and preventing the um, the main characters, uh, Morpheus. Neo and Trinity from from liberating people, from showing them gnosis, from pulling them out of the matrix. And so these uh, agents serve as archons, 
fallen angels that are, are preventing them from, from doing this. Um, but of course, what's um, another interesting twist is that really it's the humans who have, who through their malformed wisdom, created artificial intelligence in the first place, and then the artificial intelligence creates the malformed world for the humans. So it even starts getting, you know, abstracted down there. And um, they, they, uh, they called, a Gnosis would bring you to this uh, sacrament that they called apolytrosis. Um, and it means not many something. Uh, but that's what it means release. And so the idea would be to release yourself from the power of the demiurge, the power of the architect, the power of the matrix. So this would be the, uh, the main thing from, from uh, Gnosticism. So again, we are uh, another one of the um, mythologies from the Gnostics um, that somehow that the creator from the Old Testament, who they called Yad Neboath, um, tricks was tricked somehow into infusing humans with at least a, a, some divine, some spark of the divine, which um, actually, if you know the story of Dionysus, comes goes goes back there. Um, the uh, the Titans destroy him. And, he ends up uh, creating, they're creating uh, humans, and the humans have this spark of Dionysus, so we have this little spark of the divine uh, within us. Um, so in one story, he was tricked into that, and uh, they were, essentially we are pearls in the mud of the physical, and the idea of the Redeemer of Christ coming in to save us in the form of Gnosis. And Gnosis is wisdom of the nature and origin of reality and the cosmos. And then our ascent there again is prevented by these fallen angels. And in the second movie, one of the most interesting fallen angels is a character called the Merovingian. And uh, the Merovingian kings, is, so it's a reference to this uh, ninth century uh, French dynasty. He speaks French, but he's, uh, he's really a French wannabe. He, uh, he, he likes to speak the language. He Essentially, these fallen angels, and he has a wife, Persephone. So um, they also have the reference back to Hades and the underworld and things like that. Um, but he's just sort of, he, he and, his, and Persephone are simply, essentially vampires for human feeling. All right, so these um, archons, these uh, fallen angels, one of the reasons that they're so interested in us and, and in, in humans because we have these these uh, essential aspects that they are not um, directly privy to, so they, they hover around us for those reasons. So, and then again, this whole Merovingian thing is uh, is weird in that the, the uh, there's a book called uh, I think Holy Blood, Holy Grail. I forget the talk, the authors who speculate that the Merovingians were, were um, descendant from the bloodline from uh, Christ and Mary Magdalene, whether either Christ didn't die on the cross and you know, um, moved, to, uh, moved to France and uh, you know, drank wine and, and had a nice little life with some kitties, or um, whether she just carried his child or however that was supposed to work. But anyway, they're supposed to be direct descendants of, uh, of, of Christ. And, um, and then, I, because I did a lot of research on the web, uh, you can find some really out, out there things. And one of them was that they also are descended from the Nephilim, uh, Old Testament. So he's a holdover. So I talked to you earlier about the, about the, the cycle of the Matrix. Well, he, he's created his own little world within the cycles and is able to withstand the movement of the cycles somehow. It's not explained how. And uh, they just sort of like have this restaurant, and they're just vampires for human sensation, human feeling, human emotion. And then she ends up betraying uh, Persephone, his wife or whatever, ends up betraying him for a kiss. Again, reference to Judas. But and, and she just, but she can't feel. She's a machine. She's AI. She can't feel the human emotion, but she's she's so attracted to it. So even just. Being in the vicinity of it um, is something that they, they look for. 
Um, they live in a place called the Chateau, which is uh, possibly a reference to Rennes the Chateau, which is um, oh, probably you know the, uh, the, the the most central place of uh, conspiracies. Is that an archon? <laughs> which is a place I visited back in the 80s, which is just kind of interesting. But, um, so there might be that reference there. Uh, and I am, I'm going to tie this whole idea of these angels wandering around and being sort of vampire human stuff as we, as we, as we go along. So is everybody doing okay? Can, hang on, I got a quarter after I was probably go maybe another 20 minutes and then we can do questions and drink water and then be happy. <laughs> so the next uh, section I took <clears throat> was about traditional initiation, uh, something I'm kind of interested in. And there are traditionally seven stages of an initiation process. And the titles of these seven stages, the first titles, if you have in your handout, they come from um, the Mithraic tradition, the, the rites of Mithras. Um, and they also, but I also have other words next to them, and they also come from uh, the Rosicrucian and um, from the Grail tradition also. So they're kind of different names. They're kind of essentially the same thing. And I was, I was kind of pleased I was able to kind of work something out you know, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't say this is certainly not what the, what the Wachowski boys had in mind. But um, there's a process here, and it kind of it kind of works out. So at least, at least some of them do. And what I also did, each, each stage also has a planet associated with it. And uh, just for fun, I also connected a, um, the, uh, the, the seven uh, Christian Catholic, I don't know if I guess the all Christians do it, Sacraments, sacraments in the tradition that um, sort of became, you know, the because the, the, the initiation tradition died out. So the whole seven sacrament system within the Christian tradition um, sort of became that. Except of course you can't get to number seven because you can either become a priest or you can get married, right? So it sort of limits you to, to <coughs> you can only get six. So. Um, the first one, which is called the uh, the Raven, cracks means Raven. A lot of these are on uh, Latin. Whereas the Neophyte, so the, the name of the initiate is the Neophyte. In fact, the first time I saw the movie, when I saw Neo, that's the first thing I thought of was Neophyte. I didn't even anagram it to the one or to um, Eon or to Brian Eno or anything like that. <laughs> so, so, so it's the entering into the process, and. Uh, it's, uh, there's a washing, he's washing clean, uh, uh, sort of a baptismal thing. So when Neo wakes up and he kind of enters into the process, right, he's, it's raining, it's water dripping off, off the Adam Street Bridge, which uh, those of us from Chicago might know, um, but, but also reference back to the, the first man, Adam, all right, the beginning, okay. So, um, and then the bridge, of course, is crossing over from one realm to another. Again, the reversal, he's under the bridge, not over the bridge. Um, so you have the water coming down. He receives the call, wake up, Neo. Um, and he follows, um, he follows the rabbit. And um, the, the Alice in Wonderland stuff is, is very overt. And it's also, you know, Alice in Wonderland stuff goes back to the food, controlling through food, getting bigger, smaller, wider, whatever. The second stage is called the Nymphus, the occult, the hidden scholar, the peacock. It's related to the planet Venus. And um, so I kind of equate this. So this is in the traditional uh, initiation, it's sort of you're, you're learning, you're learning about the path. It's, it's a little more on the, uh, the mental side. In this stage, this is Neo kind of in the matrix trying to figure out what's going on, right? He's, he's, he's messing with the legal software. He's uh, He's pursuing freedom in his own limited way, but he, he doesn't know. And the, um, in the tradition, you pledge to the path, um, and, and 
And of course, um, and in, in the uh, Mithraic initiation, the initiate wears a veil and holds a lamp. So the idea is that you can't see, the light, the light is right in front of you, but you can't see it because you have the veil. And then during that, that stage, the veil is lifted. Okay, so that's where he has, he has the choice, the red or the blue pill. The veil is lifted through the red pill. The third stage is the miles, which is, I assume is the, uh, where, where the military comes from, the Latin warrior, or the knight in the grail tradition. And uh, not surprisingly, that uh, correlates with the planet Mars, a good friend lately. And, um, and then it's also I correlated it with the um, sacrament of confirmation and the Catholic tradition. That's where the, uh, the bishop smacks you and tells you you're a soldier of Christ. <laughs> Happened to me. I was there. Okay, <clears throat> and so in the uh, in the Matrix movie, this is where he's developing all his sort of kung fu skills, all the skills that he's going to be needing in the Matrix itself to uh, to fight the, the the Sentinels and the programs uh, and the artificial intelligence. Um, he um, he learns to see the terror of the situation without um, blinking and uh, controlling one's own mind. And so and this is part of Morpheus' teaching to Neo is that the mind is, is, uh, is everything. Why are you out of breath in this computer simulation? You know, this is all your mind. And then, you, and then when he goes to see the Oracle, of course, and, and I need to get into the whole Buddhist reference and stuff, but you got the, the little where they killed, they call it Spoon Boy there, you know, with a little English accent. <laughs> Saying, they're not been to spear, it's impossible. <laughs> Just, there is no spear. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that's a reference to, um, sometimes you think that you've read too many books. Right. right? That's a reference to uh, Hui Neng, the fifth patriarch of Chan Buddhism. Chan Buddhism is the Chinese version of Zen Buddhism. Zen originally were dhyana, which means meditation in Sanskrit. They moved to China, became Chan, became, moved to Japan, became Zen, moved to America, became Beat. <laughs> but um, so anyway, he says it, what's, it's not. Uh, this, there is no spoon. Well, he's the, the story is that Wei Nang was he was kind of kicked out. He, gave, he was given the Dharma transmission, but nobody believed him because he was a cook. So they all chased him out of town. He was just looking for a place to go, and he here's these two monks talking, and there's a flag moving, and one monk says, "Oh, look, you know, look at the flag move," and he said, "Well, it's not the flag; it's the wind." And then Wei Nang says, "It's." your mind. So, so I think that's what they're referencing with, the, with that, but, you know, I may be uh, going too far. Um, but anyway, this whole idea of, of the mind being the key to control, I had a yoga teacher and, and it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, the idea is overcoming the mind with the mind, overcoming the habits of the mind, the habits of seeing the world in a certain way, the habits that the, the matrix have, has brought to bear on your on your on yourself. Um, they have to be broken with the same tool they created in the first place, and that's the mind. Um, uh, and he has to um, there I go, there's, there's the, the scene with the lady in red, I have that in there. He's just another aspect of trying to control his own mind. Uh, jumping the, he tries to jump the bridge. What what's nice is that the movie is that he fails a couple of times, right? In the beginning he fails uh, he fails to climb the scaffold, in other words, go up to reach Morpheus. He's brought back down from the building. Um, he tries to jump across the building. He fails a couple of times and, and still gets to uh, work on it. One of the nice aspects of the movie is just not you know, like perfectly made. You know, he, he, has to, he has to work and overcome things. Right, the fourth stage is the lion. And, um, and that's overcoming fear. So again, that's making the leap across the, of the building. Um, it has to do with the death of the lower self. And, uh, and, and, and I guess the childish notions of who he is. And then, like I said, the oracle, well, he thinks he's the one. Well, he doesn't know if he's the one, but everybody says he's the one, so I kind of maybe sort of am the one. And uh, the oracle, you know, just says, well, you know, maybe next life, which of course become, becomes true when he's killed and he has a next life within the movie. But the idea is that he has to become the one. And you know, as, as, as uh, Morpheus says, says to him, um, so are you saying you know, that I will be able to dodge bullets? And he says, when you're ready, you won't have to. You, know, you have that level of control over everything. And, um, 
I quoted my man Hamlet as a, who's, who at the end of that play, when he comes to his, his, his point of knowledge, he says, the, ready, the readiness is all. Mm. In uh, King Lear, he says, the ripeness of all. He used much more um, natural metaphors in King Lear. In uh, Hamlet, is much more intellectual metaphors, so he said, the readiness is all. Uh, the fifth stage is the Persian. It's connected with the moon, and I also connect with marriage. And that, you, in that, the Persian, of course, it just means a full member of the tribe. So if you were in, you know, in Azerbaijan, it would be the Azerbaijani. If, you know, depending on where you were, you become a member of the tribe. And so at this stage, he's one of the avatars, and they're all kind of a crew together, and they're, they're going down and trying to free people and doing their things within the matrix. And his, you know, he, he puts his life at risk to save Morpheus because, you know, they're all in this together. Next stage, the Heliodromos, the sun hero. And, um, and I connected this with the death rites. And this is the, in the tradition, there's a, a three-day initiation, if you go to um, most uh, obviously exemplified by the, uh, by the, the Pyramid of Giza, where there's a, a chamber, and you're essentially held in that place for three days, um, and you went into the, um, the astral worlds to, uh, to be initiated into three day, essentially death and rebirth. Christ does the same thing, death and rebirth. Neo dies in room 303. The time of his, from the point of his death to the point of his resurrection is 72 seconds, which is three times 24 hours, which is three days. Okay, so they're just kind of echoing that, that whole thing. So once he goes, goes into that, he, he comes back and then he sees he's gone, he's died, he's come back, and then, and then he sees the machine language that's holding everything together. At this point, he enters into the demon, the other angels, and breaks them apart with his light. It is light that breaks them apart. In other words, you, you, you're not going to talk a demon out of it. And you, only through an extremely high level of transmutation can, you, can this be done. How the demon, Agent Smith, comes back to the next movie, nobody explains. <laughs> he was smattered all over the place. But, he, he, but uh, Hugo, um, the character's name, Hugo, mm -hmm. leaving. It's, it's way too cool to have him back. <laughs> the movie, the movie would have been much, much worse without him. Right, the highest level, the seventh level, is called the father of the, of the, of the priest. And um, in that, on that level, you're essentially the, the light of heaven. You are the father. You're kind of embodied all these teachings. In the second movie, uh, Neo is wearing these priestly Cossack outfit. Um, so there, there, there seems to be some sort of connection there. The oracle tells him he's beginning to have the sight. He starts having prophetic dreams. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, like I said, this is not a perfect overlay, but I thought it was kind of interesting how some of these elements of the movie fit into the traditional initiation. Uh, at the end of the second movie, though, is, is his full return into the, into the source. And uh, then he has another uh, revelation at that point. So, you know, there are levels here. Okay. Now, I'm just going to talk about some contemporary corollaries to um, what's going on with the Matrix. Um, I'm going to bring up this book here, because this book came out, it's called Leading Sun by an uh, Australian gentleman named Samuel Sagan. And it's the fourth book of a, of a series called The Atlantean Secrets. And it's actually pretty good. But this takes place in the way future, and those took, take place in the way past. But what's incredibly interesting, it's the same story. It's, it's a guy trapped in a pod. He gets, he, he gets uh, pulled out by somebody, finds out he's been living in a complete virtual reality world. And it's the exact same story. Written, came out in 99. Movie came out in 99. And so it's just kind of, it's kind of um, interesting. I don't think anyone had any connection with each other. Also interesting, movie was shot in Australia. That's where he has a school called the Clare Vision School in um, in Australia. Um, and I kind of recommend it. It's much more layered than The Matrix. It's a little more intricate, but uh, I do recommend it. Um, another interesting comes out of the, the latest posthumous book by Carlos Castaneda, who 
was, he was almost as prolific in death as he was in life. Um, in a section here, he talks about the book's called The Active Side of Infinity. I have these books referenced in the, in the handout. He talks about um, this topic of topics that the sorcerers talk about. So I found this kind of chilling. So, this, so these are this is things that are supposed to be, you know, what's going on in our real world. Okay. Um, it says we have a predator that came up, came from the depths of the cosmos, and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It is rendered as docile, helpless. If you want to protest, it suppresses a protest. They took us over because we are food for them, and they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in chicken coops, the predators rear us in human coops. And it's the same thing. Coming out, this book came out in 99 also. So, sort of, sort of morphogenic resonance going on sometimes. Um, sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our system of beliefs, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our hopes and expectations and dreams of success and failure. And it's, again, getting back to the forces of control that I was talking about earlier, um, of course, the ultimate, ultimate question is, is you know, who's the puppet master? Right? You, know, you can kind of see the puppets, but uh, at this point, you know, who's the puppet master? Um, and they're the one who uh, set up our hope and expectations and dreams of success and failure. They have given us covetousness, greed, cowardice. These are the predators who make us complacent, routinary, and egomaniacal. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators gave us their mind, which becomes our mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. And he talks about how the predators, they live off what he's calling the, 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 the glowing uh, coat of awareness. And they just leave a little narrow fringe of that, of that awareness in us. Um, they, and then we all our little pseudo concerns and things that get us riled up and things like that are are food for these for these beings that attach themselves to us. Okay, so he's saying this is going on. Um, and the last thing I was going to talk about comes out of uh, Rudolf Steiner, and um, it's something called the Eighth Sphere, and it originally was uh, something sort of an esoteric topic that came out. Uh, Madame Blavatsky in Isis and Unveiled in the Secret Doctrine. Um, uh, and then also someone in a book called Esoteric Buddhism by A.P. Sinek were the first to kind of discuss uh, this topic. And I'm going to be really, it's, it's very complicated. It's, uh, and I don't understand well enough to really get too far into it, but it relates very much so. But I have to, and Steiner is immensely complicated for me anyway. But there's a, a couple of things that would be helpful to know. He doesn't have an idea of, of um, the normal uh, Zoroastrian ideas, you know, good, evil, or Mazda, uh, Satan. Okay, so I have this uh, uh, dichotomy going on, good, evil. Well, in essence, um, this particular way of looking at things sort of breaks up Satan into two parts, one called Araman and one called Lucifer, and Lucifer meaning light. And Araman is sort of the person dragging you down into pure materiality, pure uh, sensate, sensuous being. Araman is pulling you up out of that, saying, you know, forget about all your, well, you can, sorry, thank you. Lucifer is pulling you up out of that and, and making you forget about all your all your care is just, you know, just be pure spirit, you know, dance and be happy. You know, well, of course, obviously there's a balance. We need to be human, first of all, is to have these two elements. You know, the, the, the best and worst thing about being human is being physical and spiritual at the same time. Um, and working out both those, both those uh, elements. And the whole idea is, is, is getting a balance between the two. So Lucifer is trying to bring you up, saying, oh, forget about your suffering. Well, suffering is absolutely necessary. You're not going to move. You know, you're not going to feed yourself if you didn't suffer. Suffering is absolutely necessary. Forget about you know, moving on and facing fears and, 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 and progressing and growing. Um, and Araman is just saying, well, it's just a materialistic world. This is the only life there is. Okay. 
Um, the other aspect, again, and it relates back to the matrix, is that there's these, these extreme cycles where a certain amount of evolution takes place, uh, things collapse and, and move back out into another, another cycle, another stage of evolution takes place. Um, and they're called Manvantaras, which means uh, stages of Manu. Manu is an ancient Indian teacher, sort of like the Indian Adam, first man, first teacher. Each cycle ends with an enfoldment and then reemergence, reemergence, and the next level uh, takes place. So there's this topic thing called the eighth sphere, and these sort of renegade angels wanted to carve a little world for themselves outside of the movement of human evolution. Okay, and. Um, this seems to connect very strongly with the Merovingian who has his own little world inside the chateau where he's, you know, he's very uh, sense-oriented. And the idea, according to, to Steiner, is that one, that this a sphere is all around us. We need to develop sort of a spiritual faculty to, to come into awareness of it. And that the idea is to make us so hooked up into materiality that it becomes sort of like a suction for us and we sort of get sucked into there and what it is after we pass is to sort of is to be in this this world and it's it's a spiritual world but we take it to be like the material world so it ends up again very much like the matrix it's like the exact same thing where it's kind of ruled by these these archons and we're we're, we're stuck prisoner in this whole thing. Um, and the other, the other kind of interesting correlate has to do with um, uh, Gurdjieff, who in, uh, who, and, and this matrix is connected with, uh, with, the, with the moon in a certain sense, the, the sort of spiritual level of the moon. And uh, Gurdjieff also would say that we were just food for the moon. Um, well, interestingly enough, I didn't have anything to wrap up with. <laughs> sort of things to put it, to put it back together, though. Um, you know, I think I've maybe thrown a lot of stuff at you, <laughs> and I, I'd be willing to take. I didn't get a lot into the plot. If people have specific questions, you know, I'd be certainly willing to take them now. And, uh, and I guess uh, I guess that's about it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. I was disappointed in the two movies myself because it seemed like Neo just remained a prisoner I mean, through all the way. I mean, his biology, he was, he was connected to the machine to be able to go into the matrix. And I think his biology and what he was as a human being set up his experiences. In, in other words, like him flying around, him fighting the Smiths in the second one especially, was, was futile. Because he was playing by the rules of, he was extrapolating on those rules, but it seemed to me like he was just extending the rules of the material world into this other realm. It was almost like a, a numinous realm of the imagination. So he was fighting the Smiths instead of finding another way of interacting with them to move himself out of that control structure. So it just seemed like level after level of control structure. And the only thing that I saw is a, a small you know, glimpse of light at the very end was where it seemed like something happened to at least the, the material world, which was like another control structure when he had that thing where he actually seemed to affect it, you know, at that very end part. That was a glimmer of hope, and I was hoping that they were going to then make the third movie some kind of a, a thing where he was, at, you know, where, where not only did they escape from this mechanical world of that artificial matrix, but of the other world, too, which was just as mechanical, and, and even if they got rid of this other thing that was, you know, controlling them, they still were going to be bound by the rules of, right. of what they, what, what, you know, would have created and still would have created the same thing over again in some different way. Yeah, I agree with you, and I, but, I, but I do like the fact that they left something, the possibility open. But you're right, at the end, he, he just found another system of control. And, and the other aspect you brought up was something that uh, I didn't get into, um, is this whole aspect of violence. And, and, and this whole, like I said, he came in as this sort of you know, kick butt messiah, right? And with, which, um, 
you know, for most most people, is just another um, another trap for yourself to be to be in. Um, so yeah, I kind of agree, and I do hope that they leave it open. And my my personal feeling is that somehow they're probably going to work in some kind of like hybrid thing because they because he is affected. He when he enters Agent Smith, you know, he is probably affected by the machine programming in some sense or another. There, there is some sort of crossover between, and most people also think that, that the Zion world is another matrix, which I, I don't agree, because I, I, that would just be cheap and tawdry. But <laughs> I, I'm hoping he'd come up with something better than that, but, but that was a good point, thank you. But when you said the thing about the self-importance, when you were bringing up Cosmonauta, if, you, if most people understand what self-importance means, that's the whole thing that I mean, there wasn't enough spontaneity, that's the last thing I'll say to me. I mean, he wasn't acting, he didn't seem to be acting from the spontaneous level of spirit. It was more like a, a point counterpoint, you know, like you have to fly to this location to get to this place to do this certain thing, yeah. where you're in this reality where you should be able to transcend that and just be there. Yeah, and that, and that was a Marvingian's point to him, you know, you're stuck on what, you don't know why. Right. You know, you're just, you're just, this, you're just following order. You don't know why you're here, you don't know the why of this whole thing. Right. Ryan, did you want to say that? Oh, oh wait. Anybody else want to comment? Well, I had a question, a couple actually. You said earlier that when you're talking about postmodernism and people being self-reflective and, and being unable to speak about reality, I don't understand how you came to that conclusion. Why are they unable to speak about reality? The post postmodernists feel that you because we're so abstracted from reality, we, all we have is language, and, it, and it's, it's the concept of, of disappearance, and meaning is disappearing. As you're saying, as I'm saying the word podium, the meaning is, the meaning is, 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 is constantly moving away from you. This is how they, they view things. So, you know, maybe talk about postmodernism. <laughs> <laughs> so, is um, that what you call what's going on today? Post-neo-modernism with all the reality shows? Well, so absolutely flat, well, again, unbelievably non-realistic. Right, again, what are they, and what are they referencing to? They're referencing to themselves. They're just completely abstract. Reality TV has absolutely nothing to do with reality. Right? Yeah. It's all manipulated. I actually know someone whose son is on one of these reality shows, and I never watched them, but I started watching this so I could see her son on there. And, it's, and what we found out from him after he left was that the producers manipulate the script. And they have the people mm -hmm. act out in certain ways to create yes. tension and dynamics <laughs> so that there's a viewing audience because nobody wants just happy people in paradise. They want yeah. people attacking each other. It's no. just yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's all, so it's all it's another level of the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so my other question is, yeah. how would you end the story? What would you have part three be? How do, why would I have part three be? Yeah, what is the optimal ending of this? I'm going go back to the gentleman in the back who now left. You know, I would, I would, I would have Neo find another way. You know, another way other than the violence and try to get beyond, beyond that. You know, that 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 that, that showy <coughs> idea. But of course, you know, the directors are, are completely infatuated with with uh, Japanimation and with comic books and things like that. And so I would, you know, expect some sort of comic book ending. Um, but you know, if if I were writing the story, it, it would be some place where you'd have to get beyond all those all those methods of fighting evil with evil, fighting strength with more strength, because you know that's you know that's foreign policy that we do. You know, it gets us nowhere, it gets the world nowhere. However, they have to leave it open for the next sequel. They might. <laughs> They might, you know, they've said that, that this is, you know, this, this the second movie and the third movie are 24 hour, total 24 hour period. Um, I don't know, you know, that's, that's up to them. You know, usually, yeah, usually they're, they're, they're drawn out into irrelevance. You know, Halloween 72 and, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any, any comments, questions? I don't know. The food thing was kind of fascinating to me when you brought that up. Um, and how we're being manipulated by the media to eat a certain way. But my question is, what's the difference between <clears throat> us eating hamburgers in the United States nowadays 
an, an Italian 200 years ago eating the fall of the spaghetti in Italy, in, this, in, the, in the purity of, of what they're eating and the spiritual connection they're having, other than the chemicals, I mean, I understand the chemical part and all the, the uh, pasteurization, all that kind of stuff. But as far as when culture dictates to people what they're eating, generally, I mean, Germans eat a certain kind of way, Italians eat a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. So where is the prostitution here in our eating habits because we're eating what the media is suggesting? Well, well, we're eating, we're always eating life. We're always taking life to eat. Well, right? meatball is life. Right? I'm saying, we're always doing that, right? Right. Now, the question is, what is the life that you're taking? You know, what is the life that you're bringing into? Because you're bringing that life, which, which is its whole karmic momentum, its karmic history, its life. You're eating that. So if it is, it is a cow that's, you know, run around in the Cambrian pastures, you know, and, and had, you know, a nice life for a cow whatever that is, right? And, and then you, you slaughter it in a ritual way, and you respect it and eat it. Think, think of course, you know, the, the standard of, in, in our imagination, of course, the American Indian, the buffalo, you know, you would do a ritual, you would shoot the buffalo, you would eat it, you would use every aspect of the, of the buffalo, buffalo, except the Gary Larson cartoon, this thing that you couldn't figure out what it was. <laughs> you know, take that as opposed to the life of an animal that's, that's you know, lived in incredibly close proximity, it can't breathe because it can't expand its lungs, you know, in proximity with other animals, and, you know, it's electrified to death, it's gone through this sort of very mechanical kind of thing, it's lived in terror, lived in fear, that's what you, that's, that's those are the sort of things you're pulling into, so, so if you, you know, yeah, materially, you probably couldn't find a chemical difference between the two, right? But spiritually, there's a huge difference. Sorry. There's a lot that I'm thinking about, and I don't know if I have any questions, but the most important thing for me is to collectively, idealistically, I'd love to see us all break out of the matrix, just unplug from it. And it's getting to a point now where, you know, it's do or die, you know? And, um, one thing that was amazing for me yesterday, I, I met this man, we were talking about the Federal Reserve a little bit, after we were doing some satsang and stuff. And this guy pulls out some silver coins. It's a combination. You know, like pure <laughs> silver. And that's what he uses for money. Uh -huh. It has nothing to do with the Federal Reserve, like he's unplugging from the matrix in that way. And that's, to me, is really, really cool. Yes and no, it depends what you're buying, right? Yeah, right. John F. Kennedy, three months after he put the silver certificates back in, in circulation. He, he, he died, yeah. He right, he also threatened to splinter the CIA who was out of the But, um... Yeah, let's not go down the jam. <laughs> <laughs> be a long night. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, what I feel we need to do is, you know, each of us individually, we need to reconnect with that, you know, spark of God from within, right? Mm -hmm. To find out how powerful we really are and who we really are. And it's like, you know, looking at things politically, you know, on the news today, I was hearing like that whole fiasco thing in California. They halted the elections so they could allow these, you know, computer generated election machines mm -hmm. to come in. And to me, I've, I've been researching a lot of that. It's like there's been a lot of really strong political figures that own stock in those companies. Yeah, well, that's and there's also been a lot of proof that there's been a lot of fraud with those machines as well. Right. And well, so that really lit a light bulb for me. It's like, yeah, of course they don't want these, you know, regular voting machines and they want these computer ones so they can, you know, continue on with that agenda. Right. Well you that's know? like further that's like another abstraction, you know, like a Baudrillardian abstraction. We we think that there's some relationship between us push, pushing buttons on computers and you know this tally somewhere else. You know, whereas you know Amina over here, who was you know got into computers back when they had pull starts, I'll tell you that it's easy, he's very easy to manipulate those things. You, you know, want something back there. Oh. Uh, I just want to say, like you know, the people who are like I forget who you call them, like the you know puppet masters. It's like. They want this agenda, and if they came up with it overtly, we'd all be like, no, no, no. So they create this problem, 
and then we react to it, and they already have the solution that they roll right in. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's so. it's a tough nut, no doubt. It I is. I would say it's interesting when we look at the fairy tales, the legends, the movies, the stories. They're giving us stories, and they pick up bits and bits and pieces about food, but not that much. So they may not have been aware that we did not have the spiritual laws of life, the higher, bigger brothers and sisters. You know, that was part of the Christ mission was to not suck and die and not, and to do what we had to do, know what we had to do for survival and to continue us. Roses do not grow in ground beef. The rose of Sharon does not grow in ground beef or ground lamb, see. So it goes back to the postmodernists may have started with the Passover. That was a false, that was not divine authority. Because there was no authority to slaughter a lamb. There was no divine authority to slaughter a lamb. So it, it's coming back to, you know, here's Mars. It's so much closer. We're in a, in a place where we can be found. And hopefully they'll recognize us enough to, to you know, the, 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 some of their bones are still down here perhaps in their own family lines. And, and the people that didn't get the, the flesh was not the meat spoken of by Christ Jesus, but there were those that were in opposition to it. The flesh, the, the flesh was independent in Jesus. One of their writings that had been uncovered by all Jesus. That, um, of course, yeah, of course. Are different. So I think maybe it'll all come together, and and you'll see the Matrix. The Levite, the firstborn Levite man of the Matrix, he may be tired of the Matrix and, and want the real books to be edited. And, and to see that the, the lie was the slaughter. And, um, and no longer um, give himself up to the matrix. Yeah, well, on, and then on the other hand, everyone who, who grew up as a, as a Catholic is technically a cannibal. Uh, <laughs> anybody else have any? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. sure that your name is on the mailing list, uh, email or snail mail, we'll mail it to you.